Good afternoon. Actually, it doesn't matter whether it's afternoon because it's afternoon somewhere and we're in a global marketplace. So that means it's afternoon, morning, and everything somewhere at the time of recording and at the time of listening. So good afternoon is more a sense of chill that the work of the morning has been done. And now we can chill into the afternoon knowing that the evening is ahead. And this will also help me uh, burn through an extra minute at the beginning of the podcast. All right. This is episode 19 of David Wheatley's podcast with yours truly, David Wheatley, talking about whatever pops into his head. So, um, yeah, thank you all for joining and we are pressing ahead. So today I would like to talk a little bit about a seminar. Perhaps it was a workshop that I took at the University of Southern California, otherwise known as USC, in the late 70s, and it was offered by the Entrepreneurship Program, Richard Buskirk, B-U-S-K-I-R-K, was at that time the head of the Entrepreneurship Program. He is or was an author. I need to check and see if he's still with us. I know his ideas still are, which is, is a testament to him and to his work. It was an all-day Saturday deal. He had a guest or two, but it was mainly him. The first section of what he did was to dispel the myths of entrepreneurship. You can't get in because of this. can't get in. You'll be thrown out because of this. And then the four main qualities required to be a successful entrepreneur. And then another section. But I'm going to focus on the four main qualities today. The four main qualities are perseverance, action, persuasion, and valuation. He told a great parable for perseverance. By the way, in perseverance, a lot of people put an R in the middle. There's no R in the middle. So it's perseverance, but it's pronounced perseverance. English language. Sorry to our international friends, but this is what you have to deal with. It's a barrier to entry, but I know you can cross it. Okay, so... This is the ability to continue on no matter what. And Buskirk said that the goal of entrepreneurship is not profitability, but survival. And this certainly applies, or it has for me in the entertainment business, to stay with it. Stay in the game and be there on the day that the person finally calls up and says, hey, we want you to do this. You have to be open for business because you're open every day for business. The parable is a fish is out swimming in the ocean having a great time. And through no fault of, I'm going to say, his own, he's washed up on the sand, the tide recedes, and the fish is flopping on the beach. That fish knows if he or she keeps flopping long enough, it's only a matter of time until the tide comes back in to wash the fish out to sea to live hopefully ever after. But if the fish stops flopping, he's dead. So the key is you got to keep flopping. I like that one a lot. In fact, Buskirk mentioned that people had come back to his uh, program to visit years later and said how much they used that parable. So I encourage everybody out there to consider it as well when the going gets tough. And there are days when the going gets tough. This applies to entrepreneurship, which is putting together elements of a project outside of an organization. And it also applies to intrapreneurship putting projects together within an organization using inside people, which are often monopolies because you're stuck with the people who have those jobs and you have to work with them and do special challenge. But it also can be a few inside people and a few outside people. Number two is action. You said it doesn't matter so much what you do as long as you get out there in the world and to keep the water motif going, splash some water, draw some attention to what you're doing, talk about it. Shake some hands and build up energy uh, from that. And sooner or later, uh, you find your way. It's easier to steer a car that's moving than one that's still. So always be on the move, or as in L.A., on the prowl. Persuasion. The ability to persuade others to our point of view. And that is special skills. Any kid who's talked their parent into giving them an allowance or taking them to the movies knows how to do persuasion. And that is, I'm going to say, everyone. Valuations. This can be a bit more tricky. By the way, when I said prowl, I didn't mean to say that somebody would be 
looking to take advantage of somebody. I just thought the word sounded good and it reminded me of that Stray Cat song. And so that's why I said prowl. And looking for opportunities, whatever word you want to use for that. Having your minds open, driving down the road, looking for things, not being too close-minded or fixed on one particular idea, solution, or way of doing things, but being open to the other possibilities on the side of the road. A lot of metaphors today. Valuations, this can be tricky. If somebody has $100 in their bank account, just about everybody could agree that it is worth $100 and what it can buy. There's often the cognitive dissonance group who complain, well, what about inflation? If it's worth 100 on January the 1st, on December 31st, it's going to be worth only 95 in terms of what you can buy with it. We're not talking about inflation with this model, so we can rule that out. You can go and do your own podcast on inflation, and I'll listen to it. Just let me know. The valuations become way more interesting, at least to me, when we start to predict into the future what that 100 is going to be worth if we exchange it for something, such as putting it into a copyright, buying a share of stock. Sounds like somebody's having a party. We've exchanged the clompers for the party animals. So it's good to know that we're in the center of everything here and that there's a lot going on. Valuations. I think it requires some calm to be able to do it. When you look at the old days of the New York Stock Exchange and people yelling back and forth and buying this and a trader in Chicago with a phone in each hand, you know, New York buy, Chicago sell, there's a frenzy to it. But it looks to me that things are more calm now. People sitting in front of their computers, office buildings are at home doing their trades. The stock market is particularly good at valuing stocks. So when they say that a while ago, more than a while ago, one share of Apple is worth $100, this is because thousands or millions of people have studied its future prospects based on the news available, hopefully no insider news, but the news available and decided that one share is worth 100. And so they offer to buy it for 100 on the hope that it's going to go up and somebody else across the land is selling that share for 100 because they think it's going to go down. And they want to cut their losses. That's fine for them, and I'm in that game too. But the part that gets way more interesting to me is the the riskier end where the 100 can go to 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000. Oh, yeah, David, like what? An example would be intellectual property. One would be to write a song and go into the studio. A friend has a studio, buy some pizza, bring in a singer, 50 bucks. And that $100 gets converted into a recording, which then can be posted on social media. I don't really include YouTube as social media because it's not as back and, the forth, back and forth. It's more of a posting and comment situation rather than dialogue format, such as Facebook for older people and some of the younger formats. Nevertheless, no matter what it's called, that is an outlet for it so that more than $100 of attention can be garnered for the person who created it. And maybe it then becomes worth $500 or $1,000 or $10,000. On the other hand, there are sometimes people who don't like it at all, so it could be worth zero. But the nice thing about partly living in California and being an entrepreneur is we try things. And we add to our vast and growing volumes of knowledge, the experience of having done this one for a hundred to make this particular song and tried it and met the people. And that's part of taking action and splashing water. So people are out there and that they know that this particular songwriter writes this music and that they're, they're strong enough, bold enough to uh, take a stand. They're not sitting on the sidelines of the gambling table or the roulette 
table and say, well, I'm never going to place a bet. They place a bet, 100 bucks on this song, and let's see what happens. And they do it. And I believe that the world starts to react to that, and the world starts to say, hey, uh, welcome. We are glad you're here. Everybody, we got a newcomer. We're going to check this person out and see what they got. And even if it's not too good, if they're new, we're going to give them a pass and they get to come in and try again and again. I think society, especially in California, welcomes newcomers, people that take chances. And also people that got, have got some moxie. Our former governor was quoted as saying something like, which I will misquote, that California is based on a tradition of uh, explorers and to some degree hucksters. These are people that get up there at the back of a covered wagon and try to sell their snake oil or Bible salesmen, sell what they've got. And this is partly of what makes the United States great in the world is the ability to sell things, which brings us to the persuasion part, takes us back to the persuasion part. But I think it's important to know what things are actually worth, at least to try to get a range and uh, I was asked to do a deposition one time for this car accident thing. And the lawyer at the beginning says, well, we need to set up some guidelines as to how you're going to characterize what you say. And the example is the table right in front of me. He said, when we ask you, what, is the, what are the dimensions of this table? You might estimate it. And estimating is valuable. How long is it, they're going to say, and I'm going to estimate it as eight feet. If they say, how long is it exactly, and they hand me a tape measure, and I measure it exactly, and it's eight feet, I can say, it is eight feet. But if I'm in another room, and they say, how long is this table in that other room, and I've never seen it, I don't know. So in that case, I need to say, I don't know. But there's a big difference between not knowing and estimating. And we need to hone our abilities to estimate and to make them more and more exact based on experience and true measurements and compare them. So that when it comes time to making an informed investment of time, energy, love, talent, and money and people into a project, we need to be pretty darn sure that our numbers are right and that it's going to produce the desired result that it's going to pay off. This is Podcast 19. Thank you for joining us and listening in. Feedback welcome, davidwheatley10 at gmail.com. Patreon subscribers, yes, even more welcome. We look forward to seeing you on there with your contributions, large and small, especially large. And with that, we sign off for, for today. Wishing you all the best. Bye for now.